Welcome to Back in Crime, a podcast presented by Texas Crime Travelers. I'm Stuart Fillmore, retired FBI agent. And I'm Todd Hiles, retired Secret Service agent. In this podcast, we cover cases we work and some we wish we had. As lifelong street agents, we were where the rubber met the road. While the big guys were doing press conferences, we were interviewing the criminals. And because of that, we can take you inside these cases and under the crime scene tape. This is Back in Crime. Well, I am excited for today's podcast. Yeah, I mean, we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination. And I know the JFK assassination is one of your favorite topics. It is. You know, I've been fascinated with it, like a lot of things, on and off, you know, throughout my life. But yeah, it's been there a long time. Is is it true you became an FBI agent just so that you could look at the files from the JFK? (laughs) That is actually untrue. I, and, and I will say, I never actually looked at any JFK files was, while I was employed in the FBI, but you can look at it publicly now on the FBI Vault website. When you were a little boy, did your mom and dad put you to bed at night and read you JFK conspiracy theory stories <laughs> to get to sleep? <laughs> yes. I'll just If you want to think that, I'll let you think that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the Warren Commission and, and pretty much the official government position on the JFK assassination. Yeah. Is that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, he acted alone. Yes. Uh, two days after the assassination, Oswald is killed by Ruby. Right. And again, the government's official position is that Ruby acted alone. Yep. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of people that don't believe. I, I mean, the majority of Americans don't believe it. Yeah. There's a lot of unique things that have come up uh, over the last uh, 25, 30 years. Absolutely. Well, well, Todd, something just came up, what, a month ago, six weeks ago, uh, that we talked about on another podcast. Uh, uh, this, a former Secret this, Service agent yeah, came this forward. Paul Landis, who came forward and said that he had found the magic bullet. So for a whole lot of reasons that you know we detail in the other podcast, if, if Landis is telling the truth, it means that there was another shooter, is, is, is ultimately what it means. So I think the people that don't, by the the official government conspiracy, or, or the, rather the the conclusion, they're absolutely justified in that skepticism, you know. And I know today we have this uh, compelling story on somebody named Malcolm Wallace. Yeah, uh, you know, it is funny to me that that more people are not aware of this because it's just so this this is a crazy story. Okay, so uh, everybody that's out there listening. Stick with us on this one. This is complicated. Uh, there's a lot to it, but I promise you, we'll tie this in, and it, it's going to be a compelling ending that you just will not believe. We talked about this one before in a TikTok video, but you know we're somewhat limited in time on the TikTok video. But we got a lot of questions and comments on that one, and a lot of interest in it. Uh, you know about Malcolm Wallace. Yeah, and as we get going here, it, it's going to be a, uh, a journey down a bunch of paths. A, a lot of paths, and, and frankly, you know, we'll, I'm, I'll be interested to, to see our, the comments from this podcast because almost practically every sentence that we're going to say talking about this case, there is another little rabbit trail we could go down. And a whole other podcast. It, it is just stunning how much is out there um, that— Again, it's just all part of why no one believes the, the government conclusion. Well, let's let's jump into it. And, let's do uh, it. So going back to October 22nd, 1951, at the Butler Park Pitch and Putt Golf Course in Austin, Texas, the owner of the golf course was a guy named John Douglas Kinzer. Kinzer ends up getting shot to death in the pro shop. There were a lot of witnesses present, um, and based on their descriptions of the shooter and the car he drove away in, Malcolm Wallace was arrested by the Texas Highway Patrol about nine miles northwest of Austin. Um, he had blood on his clothes, and he matched, you know, he matched the description of the witnesses uh, that were at the golf course. Now, uh, Wallace was officially charged you know, with that murder, and he was released on a $30,000 bond pending trial. All right. Now, who is Malcolm Wallace? Well, it, it, he was known, I think, by his friends as Mac, you know, Malcolm Mac Wallace. So I'll probably just call him Mac Wallace, but uh, he was— Born in 1921 in Texas, he uh, attended the University of Texas at Austin. Now, you attended the University of Texas at Austin. I did. Are you trying to draw a pattern here? (laughs) Anyway, he goes to UT Austin. He's actually the class president there. Were you the class president? I I, I did not make class president, no. So there's there's so much for your pattern. Uh, He served in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, He did graduate studies at Columbia University. I mean, he was a fairly impressive guy. 
Uh, he, he goes to work as an economist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that's where he was working, actually, at the time uh, he was arrested for the murder of Kinzer. Okay, so what happens after the arrest of the murder? So uh, a few months pass by, and in February of 1952, uh, he goes to trial. And in this trial, he's represented by an attorney named John Kofer. So who is John Kofer, you may ask? Well, Kofer was partners with another attorney named Ed Clark. And Ed Clark was actually the lifelong personal attorney of Lyndon Baines Johnson, later to become president of the United States. But at that time, he was, he was just a senator from Texas. So anyway, uh, this, this attorney, Kofer, th- who's partners with LBJ's personal attorney, had also, Kofer had also represented Johnson uh, in a previous uh, lawsuit in 1948 on a uh, ballot rig- rigging scandal that was in Alice, Texas, uh, it was known as the Box 13 scandal. Uh, and I've heard that before. Yeah, and that comes back to, people can look into that, but essentially what that, the, the premise of that whole case is that LBJ stole the 1948 Senate election in Texas. With so, the election fraud. Yeah, so check that one out too. Now again, that could be a great uh, podcast That's a whole, po- the Box 13 scandal is a whole podcast in itself. It, it, it's just, it's corruption. Believe it or not, I think there's some murders in that one as well that were that were kind of unexplained election, and, election and crazy. So, uh, so anyway, for this Box 13 scandal, this John Kofer represented Lyndon Johnson, and now uh, four years later, Kofer's representing Malcolm Wallace in this murder trial in Austin, right? So, you know, it, it's really kind of unexplained how maybe Wallace and and Lyndon Johnson knew each other, and, and why would why would Johnson provide his own attorneys to help out Mac Wallace, who really the only connection that I can see at this point is that you know Wallace worked for the for the USDA, and you know Johnson was a U- U.S. senator. I mean that's really you know, and then one other connection possibly is that LBJ um, and Wallace met while. Wallace was the UT class president, and I think Wallace had organized some kind of a, a speaking engagement that Johnson spoke at. You know, because but, wasn't some of Johnson's aides weren't they former presidents? Yeah, class interesting. Presidents? Yeah, two of uh, LBJ's longtime aides. One was uh, a Texas governor, John Connolly, and another was uh, Walter Jenkins. Uh, both had been UT class presidents. So you know, I mean, that's if if you're gonna recruit people to, you know, to come to work for the government. I guess that's not a bad thing to do. So it clearly seems to be a pattern that LBJ, that's who he, you know, sought and looked for. All right. Now, uh, what was the outcome of Wallace's murder trial? So uh, ultimately, he's, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how long the trial lasted. My, my impression is that it didn't last, you know, terribly long, uh, maybe, maybe a week or so. Uh, but ultimately, he was convicted uh, of murder with malice aforethought. And 11 of the 12 jurors in the case actually w- recommended and wanted the death penalty, okay? So the judge in the case, uh, Charles Betts, when it comes time for sentencing, he just just completely discards the jury's recommendation. He uh, gives Wallace a five-year sentence and then immediately suspends the sentence, which effectively means Mac Wallace walked out of that trial a free man. Free man. He was a convicted murderer. But a free man, he served no prison time uh, for just blatantly going in and shooting, uh, you know, this golf pro at the pitch and putt course. Which uh, let me throw this in: I've actually been to the pitch and putt. That's where I did the TikTok video. It's a great little spot in Austin. If you're ever there, this is just a, a, a plug for them. Uh, go check it out; it's really cool. Um, yeah. So, so Wallace is convicted. It, you know, I think everyone was stunned. It, it later turns out, of course, that that this judge is a crony of LBJ. And again, why would why would LBJ do this? You know, why? Because at this point, Mac Wallace is just a USDA economist, whatever and he, that. And means. he basically gets probation for committing a murder. Yeah, exactly. So I think he ends up doing. You know, the it's a five year suspended sentence. I think after five years, the the, the conviction was just uh, was removed from his record. So uh, it, it was crazy for, for just openly murdering the guy. And so what happens to Wallace after 
Yeah. Well, this is where, you know, it just continues to get more and more compelling and interesting. But so about two months after being convicted of murder, Wallace goes to work for this Temco, which was owned by a guy named D.H. Byrd. And D.H. Byrd was a Texas oil millionaire. He was a close friend and a big fundraiser for Lyndon Johnson. And, and wait, they're not going to believe this, <laughs> but guess who owns the Texas School Book Depository, Bird, D.H. Bird, yeah. And he owns this from the 1930s and still owns it on the day of the JFK assassination. Crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and he works there for the next several years, all the way to, into the mid-60s. Uh, this company does defense contracting. Defense contracting companies, the employees there have to have clearances, you know, top secret clearances. Um, how does a guy with a... Murder uh, with conviction. a murder conviction on him, and also too, um, if you look at Mac Wallace's uh, uh, background, it, you know when you work for a defense contractor, that's periodic background investigations done by various, usually the FBI, but I think in this case, for whatever reason, Naval Intelligence did um, Mac Wallace's background. They they recommended year after year this guy shouldn't have a, a top secret clearance, but yet. Nonetheless, he got it and he stayed with it. So that's, you know, that's another unexplained and funky thing having to do with Mac Wallace. Okay, so now our, our story here, we keep moving yeah, forward. Yeah, so, so let's, okay, so, so just for the audience, let's just pause right there. We got a guy that's killed a golf pro that uh, th then he's in deep water. He gets uh, help by, from Lyndon Johnson. Then he gets a job from Lyndon Johnson's buddy. Uh, you know, and that's where he's working. So we're going to leave Mac Wallace there for the moment, okay? okay? And we're going to go into another case that that ultimately is going to tie all this together, right? So um, in 1961, there was a, a USDA, that's U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, interestingly, the same uh, government government organization that Wallace worked for, right, before this this murder. Um, but anyway, there was a USDA uh, inspector, or, or, you know, I think that was his official title. He's actually an investigator. Um, his name was Henry Marshall, and Marshall uncovered a series of suspicious transactions involving uh, what were called cotton allotments, okay, and they were phony. It's a complicated thing. Let's, we're not going to get into that. Just suffice it to say that these cotton allot this cotton allotment scheme w w was a guy that was selling cotton he didn't own and making big, big oodles of money from it, okay? So, so it's a fraud scheme. It's a fraud scheme, exactly, okay? This USDA inspector, Henry Marshall, he uncovers this, and he ties it to a guy named Billy Saul Estes. Now, Estes apparently made like $20 million from this scheme, you know, uh, where he's not selling cotton he doesn't even own. Estes also was a fundraiser for Lyndon Johnson. So I hope the audience is starting to see a pattern here. And in, in 1961, Lyndon Johnson is now the vice president. Yeah, yeah. So after Marshall had, uh, you know, um, found this, we'll, we'll go into this in more detail. But but later on, Billy Saul Estes testifies at a grand jury in Texas. Okay, and so a lot of these details are coming from that grand jury testimony. Apparently, he and Johnson were worried that this cotton scheme is is going to uncover a whole lot of political donations going to Lyndon Johnson that he, you know, shouldn't be getting. And so apparently they tried to bribe Marshall, the, the, the investigator. That didn't work. Johnson tried to orchestrate getting him a, uh, a promotion uh, and ultimately a transfer to Washington, D.C. to get him off this case. Marshall deny, uh, refused that, you know, didn't, didn't want any part of that. And so lo and behold, in June of 1961, Henry Marshall is found dead at his ranch in Texas. Now, um, he had been shot five times in the torso with a bolt-action rifle. He had a severe blow to his head, and there was evidence that he had actually suffered carbon monoxide poisoning. Let me guess. Let me guess. This is classified as a suicide. It was classified as a suicide. Crazy. So, yeah, it's nuts. So there was a Texas Ranger uh, at the time that that was part of, you know, his territory. His name was Clint Peoples, and Peoples 
is not buying this for a second that this was a suicide and you know he starts looking into it and apparently this guy is just dogged i mean he's just not giving up on this thing and and ultimately clint peoples will who, who later gets appointed as a united states marshal he doesn't give up on this case until the day he dies um so um so billy saul estes ultimately gets convicted on this cotton allotment scheme and some other shenanigans that keeps him in prison uh, from the, the mid-1960s all the way up until 1983. Now, he's, he, he gets released at some period of time in there. He gets convicted on some additional charges. I mean, like I said, he, he was a con man. So, but, but he eventually will meet back up with Clint Peoples. Well, so Peoples um, actually, again— Peoples is not giving up on this case. He he fully believes that. I don't know if he necessarily thought LBJ was involved in it, but he just he just knew this was not a suicide, and, and that you know that that Pete, that Marshall the dead the dead man, you know was on the trail of Billy Saul Estes. So that's how Peoples hones in on on Billy Saul Estes. Um, but but it, yeah, at one point the Ranger Clint Peoples goes to try to interview uh, Billy Saul Estes while Estes is in prison. And for whatever reason, probably because he was scared himself of being killed, Estes said, no, nah, I'm not going to tell anything. Uh, when and if I ever get out of prison, I will, quote, solve the puzzle of, the, of Henry Marshall's death. So, uh, true to his word, uh, when Billy Saul Estes gets out of prison, uh, within a couple of months, actually, Clint Peoples arranges for him for Billy Saul Estes to go before a grand jury in Robertson County, Texas. And it's, it's explosive what, what all he tells the grand jury. But one of the things that he says is that Lyndon Johnson ordered the murder of Henry Marshall and a a list of several others. And also he talks about that, that Wallace was, you know, uh, that, that, that LBJ had wanted this golf pro dead as well. So we could do probably a multi-part uh, podcast on just the allegations that Billy Saul Estes made in this uh, uh, grand jury point. appearance. It, it's crazy. Um, but for the purposes of that, that's ultimately, you know, shows that if, if we just go with what Billy Saul Estes testified to, it shows that Mac Wallace – not only killed the golf pro, but, you know, he killed this USDA inspector that is on, hot on the trail of Estes and ultimately would have uncovered Lyndon Johnson as well. So, ultimately, how does this connect to the JFK assassination, right? Um, it, it's it's really crazy, but... So, so here we go. <laughs> here we go, this, this so hang in it. there. If you've been following along, this is... Uh, exactly. Stay at the edge of your seat. So, in 1998... Um, there was a, a JFK assassination re- researcher and author named Walt Brown who called a press conference um, and presented the results of an analysis of a fingerprint that had been found on one of the boxes of the Texas in the, the so-called sniper's nest, which is what the government concluded. That's where Lee Harvey Oswald shot from at the Texas School Book Depository, again owned by LBJ's body, D.H. Byrd, um, that this so-called sniper's nest was made with a bunch of boxes, book boxes that were uh, put in this form to basically kind of give concealment for a shooter up in there. And I think there's a famous picture from this. There is. And actually, believe it or not, there's some controversy about that picture, whether that was the actual, uh, if that's actually how it looked, that it might've actually been moved. But anyway, (laughs) another rabbit trail. (laughs) So we'll, we'll, we won't go down there, but, uh, on one of these boxes, a fingerprint was found that ultimately this, in 1998, this analysis revealed that that fingerprint oh, belonged. Oh, wait, let me guess. Okay. The fingerprint belonged to Malcolm Wallace. That is correct. <laughs> to to that, coin one of your favorite terms. That's crazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the, and the the fingerprint examiner was a guy named Nathan Darby, and, and he had worked for the Texas Department of Public Safety for many, many years. He was a fingerprint expert. Uh, Darby found 34 matching points of identification in this fingerprint, 
that uh, normally about 12 points of identification really is considered sufficient for, for you know, to make a positive identification. Um, so really, it ultimately boils down to why in the world would Malcolm Wallace's fingerprint be on that box? Be on that box. Now, okay, so he wor- Malcolm Wallace worked for a company owned by D.H. Byrd. Okay, he was not an, an employee of the t- Texas School Book Depository, right? Um, and, and just to make a distinction, Bird owned the building. He didn't own that that company. The company just basically leased space at the building, right? But so, um, you know, Mac Wallace was not a book mover uh, for, you know, in that in that building. Another thing, too, is uh, during the Warren Commission, I think there was at least one, if not a couple, of FBI fingerprint uh, experts that testified about how uh, fingerprints on porous surfaces, you know, like a cardboard box, are somewhat fleeting. And so let, let's say that, that after Wallace went to work for D.H. Byrd right after the, the Austin killing in uh, the Golf Pro in 1951, had, let's say he had gone to work there, that fingerprint would no longer wouldn't have be there. It wouldn't have lasted that long. The fingerprint had been there relatively recent, right? So, uh, again, very, very incriminating. And so, um, you know, one of the things, too, that I, I pointed out in that TikTok video, and I people should go check that out, too, because I'm actually at that pitch and putt where it happened, um, is one of the things you ask yourself it, it, that that – Ultimately, who benefited from the death of John F. Kennedy? Uh, and, and ultimately, not only who benefited, but who, who would have been in a position, therefore, to direct the subsequent investigation and all that happened afterwards and what each agency did? I mean, it's pretty clear to me that it was LBJ. LBJ benefited fr- from that death. Now, if, if, if he was in it or not, he still benefited from it. And, and you know, there's another thing, too, that to me is just – it's uh, galling to see, but if you know um, the, the famous picture of LBJ getting sworn in on Air Force One, and, you know, uh, right after it happened, of course, there's a series of a whole bunch of photographs, but there was a Texas congressman there, I guess one of, another one of LBJ's cronies, giving LBJ a big old wink, you know, right there with Jackie Kennedy wow. with blood on her dress, you Crazy. know. And, yeah, so a big old wink about job well done there, you know. Um, but but also wasn't there something else going on the day of the of the assassination in Washington D.C.? Yeah. So LBJ had uh, for years and years and years when he was in the Senate had basically used his his position there to get rich. I, I mean, when LBJ dies in 1973, he's worth 20 million dollars, and this guy came from dirt poor poverty, and he was a lifelong you know politician, government employee, right? $20 million he ends up with. Um, so at the time, of these, on the day of the assassination of all days, there was a Senate hearing looking into LBJ and uh, another one of his longtime assistants, a guy named Bobby Baker. And, and we could do a podcast on Bobby Baker, too. There's some really interesting stuff in his background. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're essentially looking into um, allegations of bribery, and sexual favors by Johnson, right? But that day, Johnson becomes president. Let uh, let me guess. (laughs) The the investigation goes away. It just went completely away. Poof. Like it never happened. Because he's the new president. Right. So anyway, I've looked into all this. Again, you know, like you said, this is something that has fascinated me for a long time. There is a lot of names in there. But anyway, so to me, this this fingerprint that's up of Mac Wallace in these boxes where, you know, from where the shooter supposedly was, is just outrageous. So I, I'm not a fingerprint examiner, I, but I have had, you know, we had the basic training of how fingerprints and, and how that identification works at Quantico. I've, I've uh, on not a lot, but on a couple of cases, I've, I've studied it. Um, my research into the John Dillinger case, I got, I went deep into fingerprints, into fingerprints. okay? So, I took it upon myself to take a look at uh, the Mac Wallace fingerprint and, the, you know, co- and compare it with the known fingerprint, you know, that it was. And I, th- I want to say it was like the left ring finger. We'll just say that. I may be wrong about that. 
I, I looked at this thing, and, and there are several clearly matching ridge patterns on there. Fingerprints can get a little funky um, in that, you know, when, when you take someone's fingerprints, there's a certain pressure that's applied, and the ink um, captures that fingerprint, you know, in a certain form. Whereas if I'm grabbing a box, let's say, I'm going to, there's going to be a lot more pressure that I'm using. And so the fingerprint will be a little bit distorted. And that's where it's somewhat of an art is being able to determine, you know, when there's, apparently there's more pressure and all that. But even, even allowing for some distortion, because there, there is distortion on it between the, 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 the fingerprints there are some clearly matching points. Now, I didn't find 34 like this Darby guy, but again, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, I'm, effect- you found, you I'm found effectively enough. a layman. There were some that just clearly jumped out to me that, that there's no doubt that's a matching ridge point. So, so you believe that that was Wallace's fingerprint on the box? I do. I absolutely do. So the, really the question becomes is how and why was it there? You know, so... Let's go back to Billy Saul Estes again, the con man, that when he testifies in this grand jury in 1984, the outcome of this grand jury in Robertson County, Texas, is, you know, everybody that could have been charged in this, all this whole tale that Billy Saul Estes told, they're all dead. But they, the grand jury did conclude, or at least their finding was, that Henry Marshall's death should be changed from, officially, from suicide, suicide to a murder. Okay, which means that the grand jury must have believed Billy Saul Estes enough to do that. Uh, And they found him credible. And he found him credible. Right. Exactly. So whatever happened to Malcolm Wallace? So Mac Wallace ends up dying in a single car crash in 1971, uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Texas. And Todd, just a little tidbit here, too, for our listeners. There are I forget the exact number, but there are there's more than enough that it would be a coincidence people that died in single car crashes that were associated either as witnesses or some other association with the JFK yes, assassination. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just too much to believe really. It's crazy. So, so this start, this case started with Malcolm Wallace at a golf course. Yeah. He kills a guy. He gets out of the murder charge basically from LBJ's attorneys and a judge crony. Then Mac Wallace ends up killing a guy who was hot on the trails of some corruption that LBJ was involved in. And then Mac Wallace's fingerprint ends up on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository on or about the day of the assassination. And and we know on the day of the assassination, all the Senate investigations stopped. So ultimately, who benefited the most? Lyndon Johnson, who became president of the United States that very same day. It's absolutely crazy. I, I just can't believe that this story is not more well known. You know, with a fingerprint, you have a 34 matching points. It's just nuts. You've got several murders. You've had a trial. Any one of these things, we will be happy to go down this rabbit trail. Well, I hope more people enjoyed this. Uh, they need to read it, reach out to us if there's questions they want to ask us. Absolutely. Things that we can I look into. The, I love the questions in the comments because, you know, another set of eyes on something is always better than, than none, right? So, yeah, please let us know. Uh, we, we love doing this stuff. We want to go down these rabbit trails. So let us know what's interesting. I can't wait to hear what people think of this uh, new information. Absolutely. Yeah, look, we look forward to it. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, guys. This has been the Back in Crime podcast presented by Texas Crime Travelers Todd Hiles and Stuart Fillmore. We are the executive producers. Grace Hiles is the producer and director. Theme music composed by Eddie Bandis. Follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and our YouTube channel at Texas Crime Traveler.